Hi, this is uh, Commander Chris Hadfield. You are listening to the Great Big Beautiful Podcast. Because I've been helped over and over again by complete strangers who had no genetic, sociological, <laughs> economic, yeah. political, racial, you know, philosophical, religious reason t- to be my kin, right? Had no reason to embrace me like a brother, and they did. Yeah. And that has happened over and over again. And so the walk, I think what keeps me going are these things that I'm talking about. You know, it's not... Oh, getting to Tierra del Fuego. You know, Tierra del Fuego is so far off, I I almost never think about it, except when I'm giving an interview. Here are your hosts, Jamie Green and Justin Connors. Welcome to the Great Big Beautiful Podcast. You can find us on Twitter, at the GBB Podcast, Facebook.com slash the GBB Podcast, and Google Play and iTunes and anywhere you get your podcast, we are there. And you can call us. You can call us, yes. You're not going to be able to hear the podcast there, but you can leave us a message, 301-825-5653. <laughs> I feel like you guys need to call us. I think that Yeah, be cool. people don't call us nearly enough. No, they don't, and they should. Yeah, Because absolutely. we will play you at the start. We have before. Jeff Bogle called, and we played him, so yeah. we will play you. We're not lying. We'll do it. <laughs> we let anyone on this show. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jamie, today... We are talking to a world explorer. I love yeah. the depth of guests that you book for us. Like, there is no there. <laughs> there is no criteria if it's cool. Well, no, there's criteria. Yes. Let's get let's, no. But I'm, I mean, like, cool. if it's a cool thing that someone is doing, yes, then they qualify. Absolutely. I mean, it's we we have tended to focus on you know quote unquote geek culture, right? Um, and but it's. You know, if anybody who listens to the show and has listened to the interviews, you know that we don't necessarily talk about like news or the latest project. We talk about creativity and people's journeys to where they are. Um, and I think that those stories are obviously unique to different people, but it's not just within one genre that people have these journeys, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we still, I think, tend to focus. It, primarily on these people who are creating the things that we love within geek culture or popular culture. But there are also people doing these remarkable, amazing things that I still want to shine a spotlight on. Right, of course. And that's why we had people like Chris Hadfield on the show. You know, we've had people like um, people, other people from National Geographic or astronauts or, or, or people who don't wouldn't necessarily be categorized as contributing to that geek mm-hmm. culture but still um still are very geeky in their own way um you know astronauts obviously are very science geeky yes, you know <laughs> and they're course, yeah. and i think explorers in whatever form that they come speaks to me and i know that it speaks to a lot of people um and uh, paul salopek who is our guest today is an explorer Maybe not in the traditional sense, like he's not like Christopher Columbus or, or somebody <laughs> like that, like looking for new land. But he is he is in the middle of uh, what is called the Out of Eden Walk. And in a nutshell, what it is, is he has traced a route that early humans took out of Africa and spread throughout the world. And he is walking that route literally walking on foot um, (laughs) from Ethiopia, where he started, to the tip of South America at Tierra del Fuego. Um, It is about 21,000 miles is what he's walking. Uh, The original plan was for it to be seven years. Uh, We kind of touch on this. He's behind that original schedule at this point, so now he's kind of thinking that it's going to be more like a decade long. Wow. Uh, It's kind of crazy when you think about it, you know, that... It's a long way to walk. <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, I, 
I know some guys that just went to uh, England and did the Hadrian's Wall walk, mm-hmm. and you know, by the end it was it's eighty four miles or something. By the end of it, you know, their feet are like falling yeah. apart, and, and this guy's doing twenty one thousand. Twenty one thousand. <laughs> I mean, I did, I did. There's a walk here. It's called the One Day Hike. It's along the CNO Canal, which follows the Potomac River, mm-hmm. um, and it goes from it starts in Georgetown and it goes follows the Potomac all the way out to Western Maryland, and it goes for 180 some miles, I think. Um, but what this, the Sierra Club here, and this is a tangent, but the Sierra Club here runs this thing every year. It's called the One Day Hike, and it goes from Georgetown in Washington D.C. to uh, Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, mm-hmm. and it's. 63 miles it's 100k it's 100 kilometers so it's six about about 63 miles and uh you start at three in the morning and you have to finish by midnight and you just do the whole thing in one go and i did it um and yeah your feet are just screaming at you and now what paul is doing is not so much a marathon like he's not doing it he's not going with that end goal in mind i mean he is he's moving toward that destination but it's not a race he's not racing to get there Mm -hmm. he's not like today I need to do 50 miles. It's not that kind of a project. His project is it's storytelling and it's journalism. So it's, he's meeting people and telling stories and, and relating on basically the state of the world and the state of humanity. And if that means, well, I'm going to end up spending three days in this town, or I'm going to spend a week in this town to sort of gather this story and really tell a, a, a compelling story, then that's what he does. Um, and you'll hear in our talk, he says, you know, in some ways, ironically, he feels like he's moving too fast, uh, <laughs> even though even though he's about two years behind that original schedule. Um, and it's just it's fascinating. I, I first heard about this project. It started in 2013. I probably heard about it then when it was getting a lot of uh, the initial press from when he was starting. Um, and I've been following along ever since. And it's just it's just remarkable. And I mean, he's. He's a journalist by trade. He he spent you know a couple decades um, in, in doing international reporting. He reported on Africa. He reported throughout Asia. So he's this is in his blood. Like he's a he, he's a, he's a storyteller. He's a journalist slash slash storyteller mm-hmm. by nature, and so he's bringing that that eye to this journey of his. Um, and it's just it's compelling. It's it's amazing. Yeah. It's uh, well, and like you said, he's saying he's some in some ways he feels like he's moving too fast. This really could be a journey that could last his entire life, really. You know, the really stories could. that you could tell if you wanted yeah, to. It, right? it certainly could. I mean, we didn't we didn't talk about this because I didn't want to get too personal, but I know that he's married, I know that he has a family. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, I, I listened to an NPR interview that he gave, and that he he was asked about that. He he says, "What did your family feel about that?" And his response was, "I know this was three years ago that he right. gave the interview, um, but his response was, my wife knew who she was marrying.'" Um, <laughs> and I didn't want to get too much into that right, yeah, in yeah. talk, but I wonder, I wonder, you know, it would be fascinating to interview her. Is, is what I'm mm, saying. Yes, it would. You know? Yes. Um, but I wanted to, I wanted to read something that he wrote. This was from. Um, part of his project, his his project is supported by National Geographic. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't support him in terms of like we have a you know National Geographic truck following behind you and giving you supplies, but they do a lot of the back end um, promotion. Like I think once a year he has a feature story in the actual magazine. Mm-hmm. There's a blog set up. He writes reports from the field. There's video capture. Um, and so you know, his story is being told through National Geographic. But back in 2013, when his project started, the very first article he wrote about um, the, this, this walk, uh, I wanted to just read something now, so, so bear with me. But I think it really, it really does set up the goals that he had for the, for the walk and, mm-hmm. and why he wanted to do it. So he, what he writes is, Walking is falling forward. Each step we take is an arrested plunge, a collapse averted, a disaster braked. In this way, to walk becomes an act of faith. We perform it daily, a two-beat miracle, an iambic teetering, a holding on and letting go. For the next seven years, I will plummet across the world. I'm on a journey. I'm in pursuit of an idea, a story, a chimera, perhaps a folly. I'm chasing ghosts. Starting in humanity's birthplace in the Great Rift Valley of East Africa, I am retracing on foot 
the pathways of the ancestors who first discovered the Earth at least 60,000 years ago. This remains by far our greatest voyage, not because it delivered us the planet, but because the early Homo sapiens who first roamed beyond the mother continent, these pioneer nomads numbered in total as few as a couple of hundred people, also bequeathed us the, sub the subtlest qualities we now associate with being fully human. Complex language, abstract thinking, a compulsion to make art, a genius for technological innovation, and the continuum of today's many races. We know so little about them. They straddled the strait called Bab el-Mandeb, the gate of grief that cleaves Africa from Arabia, and then exploded in just 2,500 generations, a geological heartbeat to the remotest habitable fringe of the globe. Millennia behind, I follow. And I just think that, that that's how he began that his yeah. first article, and I think that really sets it up beautifully about yeah. what it is that drove him to do this. And, and in many ways that's still his goal. That's still what this project is about four years later it's, with another <laughs> seven to go. Probably the the conversation is fascinating and his, you know, his views and the, and like, he's really, you know, well-spoken and he's really, he knows, you know what I mean? When you talk to him, he knows, he, he, he know, <laughs> yes, he, he knows what's up <laughs> and it was a pleasure and honor to talk with him. And Jamie, we called this is the I think it was a record for the Great Big Beautiful podcast for it the is. farthest phone call that we've it done is. through we, Skype. We've talked to people in uh well obviously you're in Canada. So yes. We've talked to people in um England, we've talked to people in Ireland, um Australia once? No, we uh, no, no. I think it was just England England and Ireland is is who we've had internationally mm -hmm. on the show. Um yeah, Paul is currently in Uzbekistan. So <laughs> that um, you you would never know it just by listening. Um, Skype can do amazing things. The technology that we have now is unbelievable. Um, we had a really great connection, so for that we're we're thankful. But yeah, yeah it's, we're gonna be hard pressed to find somebody in a more remote area to be on the show. <laughs> it was yeah, it's a fantastic conversation, and we're gonna play it for you right now. Hope you enjoy. Paul, thank you so much for taking the time to chat. I know you are, um, for many of our listeners, they would probably say you're in the middle of nowhere, even though we know that it's not the middle of nowhere. But thank you for taking the time to chat, and uh, and I'm glad the connection seems to be working. No, it's a great pleasure. Um, thanks for inviting me on, and always happy to uh, talk about the project and technology in general. Yeah, so I... I think I first heard about the Out of Eden Walk probably back in 2013 when you were first starting it and it was getting a lot of press. Um, but I want to know sort of where the idea originally came from. I think it came from years of, of foreign corresponding, years of storytelling. I don't think there was a single sort of epiphany or aha moment. It was more a cumulative uh, idea that came from traveling around the world. I used to work for newspapers um, back when print was king. And um, I covered Africa for more than a decade. And as the media went through its crisis and uh, the internet began to disrupt and evolve that business, I started thinking about changing my own approach to storytelling. And, and so having traveled through kind of distant corners of the globe, which is a concept that you know, I'd like to talk about what is distant, distant from where, right? Um, mm -hmm. um, I thought, look, I've, I've, I've covered wars, I've covered uh, elections, I've covered environmental crises, I've covered refugee stories, and it was an enormously enriching, sobering, um, kind of an ongoing uh, life-learning career, but it was always fragmented. It was always atomized. Um, the news never, you know, comes to the surface in a rational way. It's, 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 a, it's a fractured experience, the way life is. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought, let's, do, let's find a, a way to tell a coherent story that is inclusive as possible, that touches all of us. And my, my degree is not in journalism. I'm a journalist. But um, I studied biology. Mm -hmm. And I have an interest in human origins, um, in a, an interest in the past, in archaeology. And I think I'm fascinated by the, why, the way the past informs current events. So I decided to use my scientific background in combination with my storytelling a career to do a narrative that stretches literally across the planet 
um, not randomly, but directed by archaeology, anthropology, genetics, um, mm -hmm. to recreate the first human diaspora out of the mother continent in the Stone Age, to follow the footsteps, as it were, um, literally on foot by walking of the first human migration across the world to the farthest corner of the globe. And after I did a little bit of homework, um, the farthest corners of the continent, scientists told me, um, was the very tip of South America that our ancestors arrived at mm -hmm. about six or 7,000 years ago. So my walk, uh, again, it was kind of an organic coalescence of life experience. Yeah. When when the the idea was gelling in your mind and you said, I think this is this is what I'm going to do. This seems like it's a really great idea, and it's you know it's a it's going to be a great outlet to tell these stories. What were the initial reactions when you first told people that you know, you said, Hey, I'm think I'm going to walk 21,000 miles around the world. Well, it depended on who the audience was. <laughs> if, if, if it was my friends, my friends and family, people who knew me, they said, Ah, okay, good. You yeah. know, Adam Blake, go for it. Um, they know me. Yeah. Uh, when I was trying to sell this to, you know, partners, people who might be able to help me pull it off, um, there was often like a five stage, you know, reaction of like reacting to to a death in the family. <laughs> where, you know, there was like denial. You know, there was, you know, head slapping, amazement, and and often hilarity was uh -huh. in there too. People would just break out laughing. But eventually, <laughs> you know, if, if I could get them through all these stages, these reactions. I think a little bit of wonder kicked in, and not not because of me or because you know whatever what I'm doing. It's just the idea of finding a, a story that connects us all. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, and in a very very physical way. You know, this is not an abstract sort of you know flight of fancy through you know um, that I'm based somewhere and I'm I'm writing about um, science, I, although I am, or you know human events. I'm actually kind of trying to walk through them with my own two feet. And that, that kind of sparked people's imaginations, as I hoped it would. Yeah. So you began this journey in 2013, and the plan is that it will continue until 2020. Any doubts that you'll make it to the end? Oh, enormous doubts that have kind of veered into uh, skepticism and actual denial on my part. I've had to kind of extend <laughs> this enormously long deadline. I'm, I'm like a year, a year and a half behind my schedule. But, you know, I, I'm forgiving. I forgive myself because, look, I mean, I've never walked across the planet Earth before. And, <laughs> what it's going to take. and there are too many interesting stories along the way. And, you know, there are many, many days when I think walking is way too fast of a, a mode of transportation to tell these stories well. So uh, the irony is I think sometimes I'm walking too fast. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you know, I'm, I am started in early 2013. I'm, what is it now, more than three and a half years in. I'm basically just getting into the heart of Asia. I'm about a, about a third of the way through. So I think this will take more like a decade. And yeah. the 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 finish line is still established at the geographical endpoint. It's the Beagle Channel off the point of Tierra del Fuego in South America. But the time is now a bit more vague. Yeah, that I, that was actually I was going to ask you about that because I was looking the original map for your walk, which plotted the route and anticipated where you would be each year. Had you in India last year and China this year, um, <laughs> but actually we haven't even said where you are right now. You're in Uzbekistan, That's um, correct. and so you haven't even made it to India yet, which is where you were targeted to be last year. So uh, right. you're not necessarily behind schedule. You just intentionally slowed down your pace. Right. Let's just say I'm in Asia anyway, <laughs> which is a huge relief. Um, yeah. So yes, I'm somewhat on track, and and you know the excuse that I use is the original human populations that, that moved out of Africa on foot, the hunter-gatherers, um, they didn't have an even a destination in mind because they hadn't invest, invented a destination yet. So I'm, I'm at least got a foot up on them. Yeah. On a trip like this, are there certain things you just can't plan for, such as wars and other conflicts? Have, have you needed to adjust at all because of anything like that? Oh, yes. Um, and that is built into kind of the philosophy of this walk is that, you know, I, I would never, I mean, guys, I would never want to do it if I had it so pre-programmed that I knew every month where I was going, I would, I would, I would have stopped long ago. Serendipity is a really core pillar of this idea. I mean, I, what delights me as a storyteller, what delights me as a human being is surprise, right? All of us, um, you know, none of us want to have an enormously predictable life. We struggle against prediction and, and against routine mightily through a variety of means. So 
I do my homework. I do my research. I read books. I interview people before I arrive into a region or cross a river or visit a city or, um, you know, get a visa for a new country. I do all the stuff that you guys would do that all that any conscientious travelers do. But I also leave the journey open to chance a lot. And I navigate by the seat of my pants and I can't tell you where I'll be sleeping, um, you know, a week from now, much less a month or a year from now. Um, it depends on climate. Um, you know, sometimes, for example, I hit the Caucasus Mountains um, in between Turkey and, and uh, the country of Georgia in midwinter. That it was never my intention. And the conditions were so brutally cold that I had to pause the walk in the capital of, of Georgia, in Tbilisi, for, mm-hmm. for a while. Um, another problem are, are human-made obstacles that our ancestors didn't run across back in the Pleistocene, things called borders, right? These imaginary lines <laughs> yeah. um, that, that in, in, in today's world, I, I compare them to the glaciers of the Pleistocene because you hit, you hit them and they're like a, wall, a mile, wide, mile high wall of ice. I mean, they are impassable. If, if there's a guard and a guy at a checkpoint and he says you can't come in, you know, you can do what, you know, early humans did in – Siberia, as they waited 4,000 years for, you know, the ice to retreat before walking across into mm-hmm. Alaska. I, mm-hmm. I don't have that time. So I walk around countries. And that happened with Iran, unfortunately. Um, I was never granted a visa for Iran. And that blew me north into yeah. uh, the Caucasus. Hmm. One of the, not one of, I mean, one of the major things that really sp- speaks to me about this project and the reason that I, you know, sort of fell in love with it when I first heard about it three years ago um, and that I've been following along is kind of twofold. Um, I, I, my degree is in anthropology. I focused on human origins. Um, I did, uh, my one of my archeological field schools was in, uh, Kenya. It was for, uh, Mm. human origins. And I spent after, well, recently, uh, about 10 years ago now, though, I spent three years, I traveled around the world overland. Uh, I didn't walk at all. Um, but it was, you know, I didn't use planes. And I went around the world. The only time I used the plane was to get over the ocean. Um, mm-hmm. So this project that you're doing, um, sort of, I can live vicariously through you, if that makes sense. Um, mm-hmm. But one of the things, like from when I was in Africa doing my field school and then years later when I was traveling around the world and then to now, the technology and the ease of communication has changed. I mean, just saying it's changed dramatically is not doing it justice. You know, when I first went abroad, there was no email. You know, I mean, like we had to write on those blue airmail envelopes back home if we wanted to communicate. And now, I mean, then when I was traveling... You know, you had to go to internet cafes, and now we're speaking to you over Skype, which right. is unbelievable. You sound like you could just be in the next room, right? And I'm sure, just in the, the three and a half years that you've been going, you've seen developments in the ease of communication and technology, and where it's going to be when you finish, we can't even hope to guess. It, does that factor into your storytelling at all? Does that factor into the journey and the and the that you're taking? It does at a meta level. You know, I've got yeah. to admit, I've got to admit, guys, I, I looked at your website and and I couldn't make heads or tails of much of it that was on it because I'm sort of <laughs> unplugged from popular culture's sort of engagement with technology. And, I'm, and that's right. not a that's criticism. That's not a, you know, a pat on the back. It's just or anything. It's just a, it's a statement of fact. You know, you, I'm, I'm both plugged in. I carry, you know, a satellite phone. I carry, you know, a couple of mobile phones. I know how to use um, satellite technology to transmit images, video, all the tools of a foreign correspondent. I would not be able to do this uh, project without it. Mm-hmm. But it's evolving so quickly, and it's 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 seething, it's bubbling so fast that you know, if if if, if you miss a trend, and and, and this, you know, the lifespan of trends is getting shorter and shorter, you right. are sort of like. Know, three generations or three trends removed, um, you don't even speak the language anymore. And that's a, that's an interesting epiphany for me because I was always plugged in as a foreign correspondent, talking to editors every single day, um, you know, scanning the news uh, on the internet, on laptops, on mobile devices. I still do that. Don't get me wrong. But because I'm walking – and this is another kind of interesting thing about this project is I, I, for me to get point to point, I often walk through enormously underpopulated parts of the world 
where there, there may be millions of people, but the infrastructure still isn't there to have a fast enough internet connection to do what we all do, you know, in the global north. Mm-hmm. And so everybody kind of is is a little bit trapped in amber. And so what does that mean? You know, the thing that I like to tell my readers is that it, this is a, a big laboratory, this walk for a lot of things. And one is, you know, the role of, of changing technology. A statistic that I cite is that when I started in Ethiopia three years ago, there were UN statistics saying that about 30, 35 percent of the world was wired into the grid. Mm-hmm. But it was exploding so fast. But by the time I would reach the, my finish line, at the tip of South America, seven years later, it would be closer to 80 to 90 percent. Wow. And what, what that will do to human consciousness is nothing short of revolutionary. I think we're living through a time in especially communications technology through this miracle that we're using right now to talk to each other on opposite ends of the world. Um, is like the agricultural revolution of 10 or 11,000 years ago. It's so drastically affected humankind that, you know, the repercussions are still being felt. We went from being hunters and gatherers to discovering both the benefits and the pitfalls of being sedentary, you know, building cities, um, you know, inventing uh, technologies that require stability, you know, that require, you know, infrastructure that's huge, city states, um, governments, sets of laws, bodies of knowledge that are transmitted through generations in a stable fashion, but also, you know, industrial warfare, epidemics, all these things um, that come with high population densities concentrated in urban areas. So that is definitely a part of this project. And um, I am not really a, a, a really well-versed in, in high tech. Um, mm-hmm. I'm kind of a an unusual case. Um in that I, I'm a citizen, I carry the passport of probably the most technologically advanced country on the planet today. Mm-hmm. But I, I grew up in a, in a setting that was in the 19th century. I grew up in semi-rural Mexico, where people still use kerosene lanterns for light. And some of the skills that I picked up from my neighbors weren't, you know, the latest tips on, on, a, on a handheld device for a computer game, but how to shoe a mule and how to plow a field using a horse. And the ironies of this recur through this project. And I, I was thinking of one anecdote to share with you about the surreality sometimes of, of being in a project that is both high tech on one sense, which is using you know satellite technology to transmit stories and whatnot, but also you know the lowest tech possible um, in terms of walking, you know the, the, the Greek bard model of sharing stories right. is when I left one of my resting points in Kazakhstan, my walking partner was a guy named Talgat, a Kazakh guy. And he was the owner of a small butcher shop. Um, and he was helping me out with a lot of logistics. And here's the irony is that he was, you know, two or three generations removed from nomadism. His grandfather was a pastoral nomad, a, a Kazakh nomad, you know, moving sheep around on the steppes of Central Asia. And yet he was the only one who could fix my broken vegan satellite phone because I didn't know how to fix it. And he was sitting there online going through coding um, to get, get the bugs out. And here's the, here's, the, here's the cherry on top of that irony is that I had to teach him how to handle horses <laughs> because he had become urbanized and I knew more about pack horses and cargo horses than him. So there's been some nice, funny kind of side eddies about technology on this journey. Yeah. That's unbelievable. Um, I want to talk for a few minutes about just sort of the day-to-day logistics of the trip. I know back in 2006, before you were uh, doing this project, you ran into some trouble when you were on assignment in Darfur, Sudan. And you were actually charged and imprisoned, I believe, if that's correct. That's right. Uh Um, Is that something that you consciously think about now? Maybe not that specific event, but that the unknowable, the things you can't plan for could just always be a few steps away? And how do you plan for something like that? Right. No, that's a good question. It's one that I get, you know, often. And again, from intriguingly from different audiences, and we can talk about that if you wish. But um, yes, I, I, you know, as, as a foreign correspondent, part of my job has been to cover conflict. And of course, conflicts are inherently dangerous. This project also has inherent dangers. And the way 
you stay safe is not by eliminating danger. You never can. Even by staying home and living in a small town or working on a farm, um, there are dangers everywhere. But you manage risk, right? So I think what what helped me, um, what has helped me um, in this project is years of experience in those environments Mm -hmm. that have uh, kind of given me a certain you know, a knock on wood, it's, it's, it's worked so far, but there are no guarantees ever. Um, a certain, um, I guess, understanding of when to really get nervous and when not to waste too much energy, psychic energy on fear. Um, and that is the key. I think, you know, you have to kind of conserve your, your energy on a walk that goes for 22,000 miles, um, that covers, you know, enormous distances across mountain ranges and rivers and, and languages and cultures and religions and political systems. Part of the key to survival is knowing when to worry. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds great, you know, but it's true. It's, you know, because if you worry a lot all the time, you're burning up precious jewels uh, that can be used to keeping you alive. So I'm not saying I'm infallible. I've made yeah. mistakes. Um, you know, there have been a couple scrapes since leaving Ethiopia um, that, you know, were hairy and, and, you know, I look back on them and thank, thank heavens that that I got through them. But I think the, the, the biggest, bigger lesson, even from my Darfur experience is that air everywhere, including in some of the darkest places in the world and war zones in places where human rights, um, um, abuses are being committed. There are good people. And one of the keys to get through these experiences, not just, you know, with your body intact, but with your mind and soul is to find those points of light and help them guide you out of those situations. It seems like almost in a stra- in a strange way that it's a completely different context, but you're probably using the same um, inherent skills, survival skills that you know, our, our ancestors did who made that walk originally, you know, like where is danger, when yes. should I be worried, and how, how am I going to yes. survive this? You know, they weren't yes. so much worried about, as about, about, you know, like... Um, you know, war zones or or, cult or conflicts or people trying to take advantage of you, but it, it's that same self-preservation instinct. Yes. Yeah. This, you know, it, it, some people in that in that realm, the military and security, call it situational awareness, right? Yeah. Having kind of eyes at the back of your head, having a three sixty degree, you know, sort of cognizance of what's happening around you all the time. Not because you're nervous, Nelly. Not because you're paranoid, but because it keeps you in one piece. Sure. And it also keeps you awake. There's a, there's a terrific, um, essay, um, um, on hunting written, gosh, 50 years ago by a Spanish philosopher. And he has a, a, you know, a take on this that I'm, I'm, I'm neither saying this is, I'm a pro or anti hunter. I'm just, I like the philosophy he's espousing is that, you know, to be a hunter, to be kind of metaphorically hunting through the world means you have to look to all points of the horizon for solutions, including behind you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that is a nice antidote to sleepwalking through life, whether yeah. you're whether you're living in Manhattan or you're walking through the Karakum Desert of Uzbekistan. In terms of this project, uh, you know the routes that you've taken, the people you've met, and the stories you've been telling. Can you can you pinpoint like is has there been something that's just surprised you the most? Something that you never would have anticipated? Yeah, there've been there've been layers of surprises, small, small to large. You know, um, small things um, is the remarkable ingenuity of our species. We truly are problem-solving species, and and I see it over and over again. And it's really life-affirming. And I think this is also one of the great positive um, attractions of technology is because you know we're creators. We we build things. We have we have hands that are connected to our minds and you know i don't get to spend too much time palling around with you know computer coders or you know people who work in silicon valley not yet you know Mm -hmm. i hope to walk through parts of silicon valley and talk about that parts of india and china where there's kind of you know groundbreaking innovations being made but this ability to innovate your way through a problem using your own mind and hands and i was just thinking about that a couple weeks ago so, you know, I, I, I bought a donkey to carry, help me carry some, some water through a dry part of, of the world. And mm-hmm. the guy, I said, would you throw in the pack saddle too? 
And we did. He did. And we, we negotiated. And, I, and it was a handmade pack saddle made out of slats of wood held together by a metal frame. And it had stirrups on it that were made by the kind of repurposed fan belts of an old tractor. Mm-hmm. And it was the perfect it was the perfect substance for stirrups. It was it was just resistant enough that would support your feet at rest, but not so stiff that it would tire your legs out by holding them in one position hour and after hour. You know, think about it, putting your foot mm. through a rubber tube. The guy was smart. He found this probably beside the road somewhere and said, huh, that would make a good stirrup. And so yeah. these small discoveries which are really old, right? We've been do- how long have we been doing this since we picked up a piece of flint and said, "Hmm, that edge is really sharp." In fact, you know, with obsidian, it's one molecule thick. You know, surgeons use obsidian in the right. volcanic glass to do surgery today because it's about the sharpest stuff around. I mean, our ancestors were smart. They picked the stuff up and started shaping it into these beautiful tools. And there's a beauty about making things that work. So that you know happens all the time and it's really life affirming. I just keep saying how cool. This is so cool. Mm-hmm. And on the other side, you know, there's there's kind of a larger, more I guess humanist revelation that I sort of knew, we all know in our hearts maybe, most of us, even if we've had a hard life, is that, you know, on balance, most people have a shard of goodness in them. Sometimes it's a big shard, sometimes you have to look for it. And I would not be talking to you today sitting in this sweltering um, room in this ancient conate on the Silk Road, if that weren't true, because I've been helped over and over again by complete strangers who had no genetic, sociological, <laughs> economic, yeah. political, racial, you know, philosophical, religious reason t- to be my kin, right? Had no reason to embrace me like a brother, and they did. Yeah. And that has happened over and over again. And so the walk... I think what keeps me going are these things that I'm talking about. You know, it's not, oh, get into Tierra del Fuego. You know, Tierra del Fuego is so far off, I, I almost never think about it, except when I'm giving an interview. Mm-hmm. I'm living in the moment, I'm living in the day. And do I meet, you know, do I have, do I have encounters that are negative? Of course I do. We, you know, that, that wouldn't be life if we didn't. But the vast, overwhelming number of them, I would say above the 90th percentile. Um, are positive, and and that's a huge source of power to plug into. How how have your he, uh, feet been holding up through the journey? I guess this is a this is a <laughs> testament to what my mother once told me is that my feet are stronger than my head, and so <laughs> they're doing well. Um, m- miraculously, maybe I don't have any too many nerve endings down there. <laughs> they're 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 doing okay. Yeah, it's I just wrote a piece a couple. Uh, days ago about this is that, you know, mystifyingly, I don't seem to get blisters. And it's not that I have any special technology to handle it. You know, I, I ran out of mole skin a long time ago. Yeah. Um, I think it's just a matter of, you know, using them for what they were, you know, biologically evolved to be. <laughs> yeah. Don't- that's, that's amazing. Uh, you, you mentioned, you know, the kindness of strangers and how people have just sort of been more than willing to come help you. How much official support do you get in terms of supplies, planning, organization? I know you have a team behind you. I know you've got National Geographic behind you. But how much how much like practical support do you get from them? I have a wonderful team that supports this project. Um, great editors and, and technologists and uh, web designers at National Geographic. And um, tremendous educators at Harvard with Project Zero, who are spreading the, the storytelling to classrooms around the world um, and at the Pulitzer Center as well um, in Washington. But that support is is stateside, and it's more institutional, right? It, it, mm-hmm. They deal mostly with the product that this journey generates, which, which are stories across many media. Mm-hmm. The actual help that I get in the field is is pretty minimal, because thank heaven so far it hasn't required too much. You know, I'm, I'm walking. I don't use a support vehicle. Um, one was forced on me in Saudi Arabia by authorities there. They were worried about my safety. But, mm. you know, after a few weeks, I, and they, they saw that I, you know, I could walk through sand dunes fine. We came to an agreement and, and that practice more or less ended. Mm. Um, I don't have, you know... A field team that goes ahead and you know susses out the terrain. It, it's basically, it's kind of hard 
maybe maybe some people will find it surprising. I, I don't think it is that you know I do most of it myself, mm-hmm. myself, and with the people that I walk through with, and that's important to point out is that you know the the majority of the time I'm accompanied by a local partner. I find someone who who's crazy enough to walk with me through their homeland, and they of course are crucial. As as kind of I, I press them into service. I say, look, if you know, I need you because I need I need your not just your language skills to help translate, which is important, but also to help me problem solve. And so we problem solve together. And guys, you know what's really cool about this process over and over is that once that happens, it's no longer my walk. Yeah. And I sort of seed the walk to my local partners. It becomes their walk, and it's wonderful to watch because they get really into it. You really get into it and they're I've had I can't tell you how many times that I've come to a border where like my Turkish walking partner says, I don't want to stop. Can I walk with you into Georgia? And hmm. I say, sure. Um and that happens over and over. It's wonderful. That's that is wonderful. Um you've probably answered this question a number of times, but I mean in this in 2016, in a world of Twitter and twenty four hour news cycles and incredibly in short attention spans why engage in quote unquote slow journalism? Like, why is that so important now? I don't know. You know, maybe it isn't. Maybe it's a conceit of mine. Maybe it's, you know, as, as we all age, we, we, we hold on to the things that we love um, that inevitably go out of fashion because we're human. Mm-hmm. Things stay the same. Um, you know, but I, I'll, I'll say this. Um, I think... We, um, for, for 95% of our history, we have absorbed information at a more human pace. And what does that mean? It means that we have been required to focus on tasks at hand for more than um, the eight seconds that people spend looking at a photo, a news photo, mm-hmm. right? And reading the cut line, the caption under it, without reading the story. Um, you know, we have this technology now that can measure our attention spans to such an nth degree. We know exactly how short it's getting. Yeah. <laughs> and and it's literally rewiring our brains. I mean, if, if children grow up this way, you know, it's not. And again, I'm not casting aspersions. I'm not even saying it's entirely negative because it's so new. I, I have I have great faith that no matter, you know, how we absorb the world, um, whether it's in tiny little toothpick bites with an olive on the end or a piece of cheese or it's these long, you know, Caucasian dinners that go on for 14 hours, um, that we're still human and we're still processing the world in a human way. We just do it in different ways. But I do think philosophically, I guess I've, I've become less doctrinaire. I, you know, I started this project with a little bit of a dogma behind it saying, yeah, we need to kind of compete with mind share on the web, create a little space, um, that will prove that, you know, the value of long form writing and the beauty and the aesthetics of like having stories that have a beginning, a middle and an end and keeping a, a thought engaged for more than one or two minutes mm-hmm. and that there are fruits and benefits of, to that for not just for journalism, but for anybody's life, you know, for decision making, for making wise decisions, thinking about things, pondering them. I still believe all that. But I also think I, the more and more I think I'm, I'm becoming more and more confident that we're going to be OK. You know, I don't think it's going to destroy human civilization if people don't read Tolstoy from the yeah. beginning to end. But but I also feel that why not create a, a small island, if not an archipelago, where that is still um, a possibility, where it, it adds to the rich texture of what's out there in the ocean of information that we're all swimming and often drowning in. Yeah. So. A line that I use again and again is, look, I'm not in the business of information anymore. Um, I, I've been in the business of information most of my adult life, writing from countries, dozens of countries around the world, literally hundreds of stories about every topic under the sun. I think I've contributed enough information, maybe too much, um, because nobody can read it. I can't even read it anymore. But what I'm in the business now of <laughs> is meaning. I'm finding connections between fractals of information, between bits and bytes of information that, that hopefully with some thought create a, a picture that has a foundation of meaning under it. So I guess I'm more and more in the meaning business. Yeah. I, I went back and I reread um, the very first article you wrote for National Geographic when the project began, when you laid out the, uh, the, 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 the game plan for what you were about to do. And you, uh, you wrote that you were walking, quote, 
to slow down, to think, to write, to render current events as a form of pilgrimage. Uh, I hope to repair certain important connections burned through by artificial speed, by inattentiveness. I walk as everyone does to see what lies ahead. I walk to remember. It sounds like those are still your goals. Is that true? It is. Yeah, I think it is. Um, and I think, you know, the those goals have, you know, come into sharper focus since I wrote those words. And, they, and I've internalized them to the point where it's almost hard to talk about them, frankly. It's hard to give them new contours because they're like embedded. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like writing about asking a poet to describe her poetry. It almost ruins the poetry. Um, and I, I just, you know, we, we walk, and I think I, I, think I added, we, we walk not only to remember, but also to forget. Mm-hmm. And I think all of that is acceptable. You know, we're all, everything, we move through the world, in other words, for a universe of reasons, and all of them are human. And I have this enormous luxury at this point in my life, an enormous privilege to do this. I'm aware of this every single day because so many millions of people are walking because they are forced to walk, right? Mm-hmm. Refugees, um, political asylees, people fleeing climate change disasters. We're in a time of enormous movement and very little of it is voluntary. Um, I'm very privileged to be able to have crafted an idea where I'm, I'm walking with intention um, to, to think about the issues that you just quoted and, and to remind people that they have, have it within their ken most of the time, if you're lucky enough to, to live in a stable country, to do this, incorporate that into your daily life, even if it's a walk around your neighborhood. And when I talk to children, I point this out. I say, you know, think about it. When you, when you jump on a bus to go to school or your mom and dad takes you in the car versus walking to school, um, think about those two physical experiences. Is, is one, you're encased in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bubble that's moving through space as quickly as possible to annihilate both space and time so you can get to your destination. You're focused on your destination. Whereas when you're walking... You may walk under trees, and so you feel heat and and coolness on your skin um, from the sun spackling you through the trees and moving leaves. You may smell coffee from somebody's window coming out. You may see a neighbor and say hello. It's just the sensual, sensory experience of that, I believe, is so deeply human and so rewarding that we don't even realize that we've forgotten it. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what the walk is about. It's not distance. It's not... You know, um, the the notion of of kind of spanning continents it really is about spanning the landscapes that we all carry inside ourselves that we used to walk much more frequently. And today we don't. Yeah. For better, or for worse, and yeah. in often cases, it's often for better. Right. I mean, how many? Uh, I wouldn't be here talking to you again if there weren't um, fast turnarounds and medical procedures to to save. You know. Mm-hmm. Lives, you know, mm-hmm. I, I would have walked off a, a cliff in the Pleistocene because my eyesight's so bad, and mm-hmm. so um, I'm not I'm not criticizing it, but I think there is there's there's space for taking a breath and slowing down. Yeah. A lot of good things in life are slow. <laughs> I, I you mentioned that there are times when you just take a break or you recharge and you spend an extended amount of time in a certain place, but is the journey more or less uninterrupted? I mean, how? Do you get away from the route, as I guess with what I'm asking? Do you get to come home at all? No, it's it's designed to be continuous. And that yeah. is also an intellectual conceit um, that at first I worried about, saying, hmm, that sounds a little artificial, and it, people might misconstrue it, misconstrue it as being kind of an extreme sport mentality. Mm-hmm. But that's the opposite is true. I, it's actually about calmness. I want to take a long journey in my life in the way that classical wonders did, which is, you know, whalers, when they stepped on a boat in New Bedford, Massachusetts, said goodbye to their beloved ones and said, I'll be back in three years. Or, or you know, ancient scholars in the spirit of Herodotus um, walked away from their homes to discover the world and wouldn't come back for a lifetime. I think Ibn Battuta, the great um, mm-hmm. Islamic traveler, was away for... I think, was it seven or eight years? It was quite a long time. And so I wanted to dip into that experience, to re-experience it, to kind of get into that long wave thinking that goes with a continuous journey. 
to try to, to re-remember through my body as well as my mind how big this planet truly is. So I don't go home unless they're, you know, I've, I've told my partners, my media partners and, and others that if, if there's a, an emergency in my family or something, I, you know, I have to reserve the right to jump on a plane and, and come home. But so far, thank heavens that hasn't happened. So yeah. the hope is to, it doesn't feel artificial. It doesn't feel forced. Um, family and friends come out and visit me on the trail. Um, and of course we use technology to stay in touch too. Yeah. One of the things that, um, both anthropologists and journalists have to overcome when they're writing stories and, and engaging in this type of work is a version of the observer effect that can distort mm -hmm. the, you know, quote unquote truth in the stories that they want to tell. Um, mm -hmm. Is that something that you consciously try to compensate for? I mean, is it? Are you aware that just by your being there, you're changing the way that things are happening? Mm -hmm. No, I am, and it's 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 the storyteller's conundrum, and I think all storytellers grapple with this, either consciously or subconsciously. Uh, and I I don't know if I do it well. I suspect sometimes I do it better than others times, um, mm -hmm. because you don't you know. Here's the dilemma, and, and, and I still clearly haven't figured out a formula, is that, you know, you want to be emotionally involved in people's lives because that's where the storytelling goods are. Because otherwise you're just um, a cartoonist. Otherwise you're just a, a reporter. You're, 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 you're skimming through people's lives making enormous sweeping um, – assumptions and indeed even value judgments on spending a day or two with somebody, which is when you come to think of it, it's absurd. Think about that in your life. If I came and spent, you know, the afternoon with you and then tried to write a story about you and you would kind of shake your head at the product. Um, but at the same time, there's something to be recommended for having some separation from what you're writing about too, because otherwise you don't have a point of view. Yeah. And there's no way that you're ever going to tell that I'm going to tell Jamie's story like Jamie, I just can't, I'm not Jamie. Yeah. So, you know, we read certain authors, we, we go to certain movies because not so much that they're movies about Antarctica or, or World War II, it's because the storyteller's voice is what we're interested in, right? We're actually interested in taking a journey through the brain of the storyteller as right. much as subject. And I think that balance is a fine one. And it's one that we all grapple with. Um, and, it's, and, and it is especially delicate when it comes to human suffering because, you know, I've written a lot about people in pain. And um, how do you deal with that? How do you tell a refugee story without somehow, even inadvertently, getting into the dubious moral muck of appropriating their, their suffering, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's tough. It's tough. All I know is, um, is I think... If, if, if somebody doesn't have the power to disseminate their story and if they're aware um, that they um, may pay a small price in misperceptions, perhaps, hopefully a small price, in having their story told by others but still want it to be to get out, that somebody is there to write it down. Yeah. I don't want to be too America centric, um, but this is an interesting time here in the States with the election and with cultural divisions becoming more and more striking and, and stark and uh, worrisome, I guess is, the, is a good word. Um, mm -hmm. How much of that even factors into your day to day on the road? I mean, are you seeing this? Obviously, you're seeing this through a filter, but I mean, does does much of it make it out to where you are or does it is it not really part of the landscape? Um, there are two answers to that. It's, it's, it filters out to me um, because this is news of, you know, quote unquote home. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm following it and watching it and often wondering, who, you know, it's not me that's walking away from my country. It seems that my country is walking away from me. <laughs> um, so perplexing and so mystifying and, and, and sad. Um, and I, like everybody else, has a two bit theory about why it's happening. But, but, by and large, what I think most Americans fail to realize, because it's human nature to fail to realize this, is that people who are over your horizon have their own lives, and they're not really following your life, just as you're not mm -hmm. following theirs. So, you know, Americans maybe get criticized 
sometimes um, for not, you know, being geographically literate and not being um, up on the news, not up on what's happening in Rwanda or, or, you know, wherever. But, you know, that favor gets returned despite the bombardment of, of coverage, the disproportionate amount of media oxygen that's, that's get, gets devoted to the U.S. And it's huge. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people don't waste too much time unless they have an interest in politics um, in in following, say, a national election. It's right. it's very it's like fourth tier background noise. Yeah, um, it might be a source of amusement. Um, it might be a source of, of wonder. <laughs> yeah, as um, it is here, as it is here. <laughs> <laughs> well, my heart goes out to you because you're in the middle. Of- so, um, yeah, I can't escape it like you can. <laughs> so it's, it's been interesting, though. I'm thinking about writing about that very thing. I'm trying. I'm still putting my thoughts together on that. And, you know, it's, you know, because, you know, I ask, obviously, I ask people, you know, what do you think about that? And, you know, the answers come back from, well, I didn't even know what was happening. And who, who, who are you talking about? To, oh, it sounds like, you know, great. You know, sounds just like us or, you know, oh, this is typical crazy America. And it's yeah. just uh, <laughs> where you are. So something I'm curious about when you're out and talking to people, um, how when you when you talk about Americans and what their view of America is, what what are you finding people are saying? Are they are they generally they don't really think about it a lot, or is it something that is in their head and they have an opinion right away? You know, that's um, it depends on the place. It depends on how how um, um, strongly the media ecosystem of the place where that question is asked is is controlled Mm -hmm. right so in some places where there's complete um information freedom you'll get an enormous variety of of, and and often surprisingly and i'm contradicting myself a little bit occasionally really surprisingly detailed nuanced views on what's happening and sort of like i learn analyses that seem really good to me (laughs) from somebody who's talking to me in you know armenia (laughs) uh, you know selling me some 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 pomegranates. Um, but, um, often people will parrot, uh, what the prevailing sort of messaging is if, okay. if the media is controlled and it's a very superficial, just as it is in America, right. um, a very superficial perception of a reality, you know, it's, it's, it, you know, it's quickly can, can devolve into conspiracy theories. Mm-hmm. Um, which there are numberless ones, and conspiracy theories are bred by cultures of um, sort of what I call news victimizations, where, where populations that don't have access to good information, that's a, that's the breeding ground for conspiracies. Um, and, you know, maybe that's a little bit of what's happening back home now. You know, if people don't trust the message anymore, if they don't trust the factuality of the news, you make stuff up and you repeat it or you're, easy, you're you know, you're subject to being manipulated more easily. It's harder, I think, I'm stating a truism in a banal one. It's harder these days to stay informed. The irony of the information age, right? Mm-hmm. Because there's just so much out there. And we all stovepipe ourselves by choosing what, by gravitating sort of the this increasingly smaller and smaller closet of information that we like to inhabit, especially about passionate things like ideologies, um, that it's, it's strangely harder to... How many people have the energy to go read, you know, 62 different websites across a political spectrum and then average them? <laughs> I don't. Yeah. No, so. no. Yeah. What are you um, What are you most excited about the road ahead? I know there's, there's, it's a long road ahead of you, but what are you most looking forward to or excited about learning? I think, um, you know, I gr- you know I'm, I'm going to sound... I, let me let me not put a preface on it. Every morning is an excitement. Yeah. Every morning when I wake up is an excitement, and I I I wish I can communicate that really well through my stories. It's I spent I had to stop for nine months in Tbilisi, Georgia, first stymied by seasonal um, problems with weather, and then political ones getting across borders. And so for those nine months, I became. A sedentary human being again. I joined the mass of humanity who settled down since since the Neolithic Revolution, doing micro migrations instead of big long ones. So I micro migrated to a small writing hutch at the National Museum on Ristavelli Avenue, with a cup of coffee in my hands, joining thousands of other Tbilisians mm-hmm. making similar commutes on foot, getting out of the metro. Right, 
But here was the difference, guys. And this is what is such a great privilege of this project is I knew at the back of my mind that the trail, the shining trail, mm-hmm. out of tendency, waited for whenever I chose to walk. Yeah. And that, that kind of pool of curiosity, of intellectual adventure, of the challenge of daily problem solving, because no two days contain the same problems when you're walking across the planet. Mm-hmm. Is really rewarding, and it gives my life a direction that I did not have when I had the great privilege of flying around the world covering, you know, umpteen global stories. Yeah. So that has been something I look forward to. Now, in terms of like regionally, I can pull things out of my head uh-huh. based on meeting, right? I can say that I'm looking forward to Siberia, um, and and because uh, I've read so much about it, and I'm a biologist uh-huh. Uh-huh. of nature. Um, and it's got a certain romance and intrigue for me. Um, so I look forward to crossing the Amur River. I, I'm trying to maybe time it with these enormous bird migrations. It's a major yeah. flyway. Um, so that's really exciting to me. I'm, I'm interested in walking through northern India. I mean, it's, it's, I, I can never leave. And a, and a story about the human journey, India has to be in there. Yeah. Uh, so um, and, and walking back through my own country years from now. Right, because I'll have been away for five, six years, and the U.S. is changing quickly demographically. Right, 2040, 2042, it's going to be a minority majority country, mm-hmm. and I think that's part of what's going on right now, the turmoil. And I think it'll be fascinating for me to kind of be a stranger in a strange land, where the strange land is my own home. Yeah, and so that'll be. I'm looking forward to telling stories on that trail as well. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. You you mentioned Siberia. I took I would. The uh, Trans Siberian. I went across oh, the entire yeah. country, and that just watching the landscape change through the window of the train um, mm. was phenomenal. And I can't even imagine what it would have been like to have walked across that distance. Um, yeah. So oh, wow. yeah, it's it's. I am very <laughs> jealous, very envious yeah. of what you have ahead yes. of you and what you have had behind you too. Oh. Uh, if you need a break, come walk for a while. <laughs> I would love to. I would love to. Um, you you mentioned that you don't think about the end of the road. This is our last question. You don't think about the end of the road unless you do interviews. But you must have in the back of your mind, you must have a plan for what you're going to do to celebrate once you reach Tierra del Fuego. Yeah, there's there's this um, a plan that has evolved on the trail. It wasn't one that I thought about originally, but as I mentioned earlier, as I walk with local people, and they've they've ranged from Ethiopian camel nomads to, to retired Saudi special forces generals to Turkish photojournalists to 19 year old high school students in uh, in Georgia um, to archaeologists. Um, I want to get them all together somehow when I reach. The Beagle Channel, and there's a kind of there's a metaphorical scientific resonance to the Beagle Channel, right? That's where Darwin started pulling his ideas together, and his work informs this this journey. I want to get them all together and have a big party, and mm-hmm. then we all walk to the Antarctic Sea together, um, the last few kilometers, because the journey really does belong to them, just as this journey evolutionarily belongs to all of my readers. Um, yeah. So that's that's the fantasy that I'm walking towards. That's incredible. Years away, but it, it sounds amazing. Paul, yeah. thank you so much for taking the time. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, you know, I've been following along since the beginning, like I said, and I, I certainly hope more people are going to, you know, jump on and, and follow the road as it, as it continues to unfold in front of you. Uh, it's been a fascinating journey to watch, and I can't even imagine what it's been like to, to live it. So uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a great privilege, and thank you for, for having me on. Absolutely. Yeah. And when you when you get to China, China is where I lived for for much of the time that I was away. But I would love to walk with you. <laughs> All right. We'll stay in touch then. You bet. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Okay. Cheers. Bye-bye. 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 Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, that's it for the interview this week on the Great Big Beautiful podcast. And I can't help but think that maybe Disney should take his stories. Got Spaceship Earth. And we'll put his stories inside of Spaceship Earth. What do you think? You just say gut spaceship. <laughs> hey, the, you know, this is whatever. So this is now a call. I am looking for a new co-host on the Great Big Beautiful <laughs> Podcast. Anybody who wants to step up and take Justin's okay, spot. Okay, we'll make a we'll- new ride at Epcot. <laughs>
Dang. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. We, we should never got Spaceship Earth, but um, <laughs> um, yeah, I agree. This is, I mean, it's, it's a compelling story that he's telling and it's, you know, in, in some ways it's his story, but in many ways it's, it's our story and right. it's, it's the stories that he's telling that makes this so amazing. So, and now yeah. I'm looking forward to part two when Jamie's going to be out on the trail in China. Heck yeah. Let's make uh, that happen. He did. He did. He, he offered and I'm, Let, I'm not letting let, that one let's go. Let's start a so. Kickstarter. I'll <laughs> set it up <laughs> or a, a Indiegogo or something. Well, I'm planning to be there next year, 2017, year but I don't think that he's going to be there yet. Uh, well, you'll have to go back when he's there. <laughs> I could pave the way <laughs> live from the road. We'll just do a whole year of podcasts of you walking with him. Dude, that would be amazing. It would be. But the question is, how would your wife like it? <laughs> and my kids yeah and your kids <laughs> come back and the kids are in high school you know? yeah like, who are you <laughs> or you can take zoe zoe with you that'd be fun zoe and sam yeah homeschooling from the road yeah <laughs> it doesn't sound fun no not really not, not, not. <laughs> so thank you so much everybody for coming back week after week if you don't come back week after week why not come yeah, join you us should. you should we have cool co- t- talks like this every week it's somebody different we've had astronauts we've had journalists traveling the globe we've had writers comic writers actor everything we've had everything we've had everything we really, oh, no, well, not really. But I mean, we haven't had a crossing guard, but we give should. It, give, us an, give us some time. We'll have it through. <laughs> well, we'll even get a president someday. We'll see. It's on my list. <laughs> it's on your list. Challenge accepted. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to get in touch with us, give us your ideas for people we can interview. Are you interested in anything? Twitter at the GBB podcast, Facebook.com slash the GBB podcast. We are open to suggestions and Jamie, will put, as he says, put it on the list. Absolutely. <laughs> and we mean it. We're not joking. Nope. So thank you so much. Hit subscribe. We'll see you next week. Take care. <laughs> Bye. This podcast has been a production of the Geek Dad Podcast Network. If you've enjoyed this content, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash geek dad.